So our series has been focused around having firm faith in a fallen world, and Habakkuk should know all about that. Uh, he sees the world uh, literally, not just uh, theologically, but literally falling apart with around him. Uh, if you've been with us, uh, you know that the historical situation around this book is that the uh, northern kingdom of Israel has been taken into exile in about 722 BC. Uh, the uh, Babylonian Empire is on the rise. They're replacing the Assyrian Empire, which took the northern kingdom into exile. They're on the rise, they're on the march, they're coming, and they are coming against Israel. Habakkuk opens the book in the first four chapters by kind of wringing his hands and lamenting about all the sin that he sees in Israel. He talks about the iniquity in verse 3, the wickedness, the destruction, the violence, strife and contention that just is rampant in the southern kingdom of Israel at this time. And he calls out and says, Lord, won't you do something about it? And the Lord says, yeah, I'm going to do something about it. Beginning in verse 9, he says, look among the nations. You'll see what I'm going to do. Observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days, Habakkuk, that you would not believe it if I told you. Verse 6, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. And the Chaldeans, as I told you, were the ruling class of Babylon. So he's telling them these guys are coming, and they're coming to bring judgment, and they're coming to bring chastisement to my people. They're going to learn not to worship idols. Kind of blows Habakkuk away. So in chapter 1 or verse 12, he says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. So we discussed how Habakkuk, kind of thrown off balance by what's happening here, goes back to the basics, grounds himself and roots himself in the character of God. And he begins asking questions, not questions of skepticism, not questions of, um, of uh, doubting, but questions that indicate faith looking for understanding of God. So we see him ask those questions at the end of chapter 1 and the verse, beginning of verse 2. He stands firm. He's waiting for God to answer. And God does answer. And God reveals to him what he's going to do. And we talked about that last time, which brings us to chapter 3, which we'll be looking at today. Chapter 3, the last chapter but back to our theme, firm foundation. First thing we need, we learn from Habakkuk here, first thing we need to stand firm in a fallen world is a clear understanding of the character of God, who he is, what he does, how he works. And we've gone through this, highlighting that as we've come in, through the book of Habakkuk, we talked about in chapter 1, verse 1, about he is the God of all comfort. He brings us comfort to us through his word. Verses 2 through 4, where we see the iniquity, the wickedness that has invaded his people and led them astray and has brought Habakkuk to sorrow and uh, <coughs> begging God to correct this. We see that he is the God of all patience. He's been giving them opportunity to repent. From verses 5 to 11 in chapter 1, we learn that he is the God who chastens his people, brings correction against them. He loves us, he loves them too much to allow them to continue in sin. In verse 12, the one I read just earlier, are you not from everlasting? We learn that God never changes. He is steadfast. He can be counted on. In chapter 1, verse 13, to the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1, he's a God who welcomes the prayers of his people. He listens. He hears them. And in chapter 2, verses 2 through 20, 
we find that he is the God we can securely place our faith in. He answers our prayers. He is not going to frustrate us. We can put our faith in him. We can stand firm. Finally, when we come to chapter 3, verses 1 through 19, we're going to see that he is the God who saves his people. He is the God who saves. So not only do we need a part of our firm foundation to stand firm in a fallen world, a clear understanding of the character of God, which I think Habakkuk has shown us, but we also need a firm and fervent commitment to God. And we see that again throughout the book of Habakkuk, the opening verse uh, to the last verse. The prophet is dependent on God and for God to act. He doesn't call out to have better law enforcement in Israel. He's not begging for that, although the law has been discarded. He's not looking for better national defense. Even though the Chaldeans, it says in verse 5, are on their way and they're bringing judgment. He doesn't do any of those things. No, his whole appeal is to God. His whole interaction is with God and what God is going to do and what God can do and what he can expect God to do and what he wants God to do. His whole focus, his fervent dependence is on God. So we have this firm foundation in God's character. We have this fervent commitment to God to provide us what we need. And finally, what we learn today is the need for frequent prayer. Now, I had an engineering moment earlier in the Adult Bible Fellowship. I'm having another one right now. There's 56 verses in this book. I counted them up. And 29 of those verses are prayer. That's um, just over half the book is prayer. The book just drips with prayer, and that's what we see here in this last chapter is this prayer of Habakkuk. I'm going to, I've kind of struggled actually about whether I should take this just a paragraph at a time or look at the whole thing and survey it. And I've chosen to do the whole thing. I think it helps us to um, get the big picture here. I think it's very edifying for us and encourage us more if we can see the big picture and it'll give us some direction on what we need to do. So I'm gonna cover these 19 chapters in three headings. First, we're gonna look at the prayer of Habakkuk, and then we're going to look at the presence of God, and then finally, the praise at the end. So the prayer, the presence, and the praise. Now, I'm going to read through these 19 verses. Don't wander off on me, okay? Keep your head in the verses here and follow along with me in your Bible. I'm reading out of the NASB. You may have something else. But let's read this, follow along together, and then we'll take a look at this in more detail. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to the Shigiotic. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Parent, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hands, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the whole earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His waves are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers or your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horse? Horses? 
on your chariots of salvation, your bow was made bare, the rods of chastisement were sworn. Selah. You cleave the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and quake, the downpour of rivers of water swept by, the deep uttered forth its voice, it lifted high its hands, sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the night of at the light of your arrows, all the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of evil to lay op him open from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret, who trampled on the sea with your horses. On the surging of many waters, I heard my inward parts tremble. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig trees should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he shall make my feet like hinds feet, and make me walk on high places. You're the choir director on my stringed instruments. So dear Lord, open us to your word. Lord, speak to us from these words that are thousands of years old. Lord, but Lord, seem to speak to us even today. Teach us, Lord, how to stand firm in a fallen world, Lord, where we're challenged on every side. In your son's we ask, sin's name we ask these things, and I ask for your spirit to attend my words, to handle your word faithfully, and to help your people, Lord. Amen. Still with me? All right. So we're going to look at prayer, the presence of God, and the praise for God. So let's look at the prayer, first of all, in these first few verses, uh, verses 1 and 2. This is, this is the prayer of the prophet. This is a public prayer that he's praying here. How do I know that? Well, a number of different things here indicate that this is a public prayer. Number one, this word, shigianeth, shigianeth. No one actually knows what that word means. Uh, it comes from a Hebrew root word, which means shaking, uh, which means trembling. So it might mean uh, to, play, to sing or play this with passion, uh, but it's a word that's instruction for public prayer. We also see through this uh, prayer, this word, Selah, Selah. Again, we don't know precisely what that word means, but it seems to be a word that says pause here. Perhaps at this point, the worship team would play an interlude to give us an opportunity to meditate or think about what was said here. But again, an indication of something that's used in public and liturgical prayer. And again, at the very end, for the choir director, here's a obvious giveaway, right? This is an instruction on how this is to be played on stringed instruments. So this is a public prayer directed to God's people from the prophet, prophets, prayer to God. And the report here that he's talking about the report that he's heard about, the report he's praying about is this report that there's judgment coming on God's people. 
That was from chapter 1, verses 4 through 6 or so, that there's judgment coming at the hands of the Chaldeans, that God's people are going to come under chastisement, that God's people are going to be corrected and corrected in the most severe way. They're going to be carried off like the northern tribes that they've already witnessed. They're going to be carried off into captivity. And there's only going to be a small remnant left in the land. And he's heard that report. He's also heard the report that the conquerors, the ones who are going to take them into captivity, are themselves going to be crushed. That they'll be replaced on the world scenes. That nations come and go according to God's plan, his eternal plan. That these nations rise up and are taken down, and this nation will be taken down. And we know that within 70 years of conquering the southern kingdom, that the Babylonian Empire was replaced by the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrian Empire released Israel back into their own land. So that's what he's heard. He's heard that report. And he fears. He fears. You know, it's okay for God's faithful people to be afraid sometimes. There's no shame in that. We're not stoics. We don't look at danger and just grit our teeth and go forward and disregard the danger. It's okay to have that emotion, to have fear. We're to fear God. And when a powerful God acts in the world, we should fear his actions. Have reverence for them. Have deep respect for them. And when we see what's going to happen, as Habakkuk did, Habakkuk looked around Israel. He was praying for Israel to be different, to repent, to change. It must break his heart to know what God's going to do to Israel. It must bring tears to his eyes. Even today, as we look around at what's happening to the church at large, we see the church at large expand, not expanding, but abandoning God's word, disregarding his character, asking, you know, well, where is the promise of his coming? As they, as they look the other way, as sin invades the church, my heart breaks. I don't know about you. But it's very, very sad to see, and I fear for what God will do. How he will chasten his people, and we know he chastens them. So this is a God who we know is going to judge. He has revealed himself in all his power and glory. And Habakkuk fears him. And he ends up praying here for three things. This is one of the reasons why going through a book of the Bible at once and not, a, you know, not looking just a verse and hopping from verse to verse in the Bible is so important. Because a lot of people would say that the first thing he was praying for here is revival. Revival in the church. Revival among God's people. He says, oh Lord, revive your work. Well, he's not asking God for revival. I mean, if you hear almost any sermon on the internet about this passage, you're going to be talking about God doing a work of revival like he's done in the past. And that's what he's talking about here. The Hebrew word here is hayah, which means life, live. Breathe life into what you're going to do, Lord. What he's saying here is what you're going to do, do it. Let's get it over with. Let's get it done. Give it life. Very instructive to me here that he's, what he's not praying for. He's not praying for ease. He's not praying for comfort or protection. He's praying for what Jesus taught his disciples to pray for. He's praying that God's will be done on earth. Not that our will be done. Not that what we think is right. What we think is fair, what we think is just. He's not praying for that. He's praying that God will get on with what he's going to do 
revive your work in the midst of the years. Remember he told Habakkuk, this is going to happen in your day. Habakkuk's asking for this to happen now. The second thing he prays for is to, that it be made known. That not only Israel, but the whole world would be known of God's judgment and salvation. He'll show the world his judgment against the Chaldeans, against the Babylonians. He's going to show the world how he chastens even his own people. But he's also going to show the world how he saves his faithful remnant, how he protects them. So he's asking for God to show, make it known what you're going to do, Lord. Express your character. Express who you are. Express your judgment for the unfaithful, your judgment for the wicked, and the salvation of your remnant. Make it known, Lord. And finally, he prays that God remember mercy. It doesn't mean that God is forgetful, that God has a senior moment once in a while, and somebody has to come in and remind him of what he was supposed to be doing. Rather, this is mostly a reminder to God's people who are hearing this prayer. This is a public prayer. They are listening to this, and they're being remembered. The mercy of God in the midst of his wrath is being remembered to them as much as to God. And he's, what he's saying here is, act according to your full person. Act according to all you are. Are you all you are? You are God who cannot not judge evil. But you're also a God who is merciful, who saves his people, who steps in and helps them. And this is, this is so important for Habakkuk to be praying and for the people to be hearing. Now, the unfaithful are going to be listening to this and they're going to say, oh, this is something to be ignored. Habakkuk, you know what he's like. He's always gloom and, gloom and doom. My message is peace, peace, peace. The message I have from God is everything's going to be fine. Just trust me. But the faithful remnant, they're listening. They know who God is. They know what he does. They know his relationship to evil. They know his relationship to people who have backslidden. And they know his relationship to the faithful remnant. And they're listening to this. So public prayer is important. It's an important ministry. Public prayer is, is something that I think in this church we neglect. I've been here since August, leading the Adult Bible Fellowship. Very rarely does anyone pray out loud there. Very rarely. But we see what in Habakkuk that he can't even almost help but pray in view of the revelation he has from God. Prayer overflows his life in view of what the answers that God has given him and what he knows about God's character. And the more a faithful person knows of God's will and knows of God's character, the more likely they'll be to erupt in spontaneous public prayer to God, just like Habakkuk is doing here. Habakkuk needs God's action in his life, in the life of his people. And I have heard the report, he says, and I fear. He is praying down God's action. Revive your work. Make it known. Remember mercy. He knows his character. He knows what he's going to do. He is praying it in. He's compelled to do that. Just like sometimes you feel compelled to pray in light of some revelation that you got from, about God from his word. You're reduced to honoring him, adoring him, Perhaps confessing your sin, erupting in thanksgiving, as every Christian should be characterized by thanksgiving, or interceding with others, supplication with them. 
over and over and over again. What would Jonathan Edwards say? He that lives a prayerless life lives without God in the world. He that lives a prayerless life lives without God in the world. And it, it really grieves me and perplexes me that we seem to lack public prayer among ourselves. Not only is it important as an expression of what we know about God and our confidence and our trust in Him, but it's also a ministry to each other. Just as Habakkuk is ministering to Israel here, through this public prayer, we minister to each other through our public prayers. We help each other when we pray publicly. It's a reminder of those who are listening, the remnant in Habakkuk's day, the faithful in our own day. It's a reminder of the remnant to, to the faithful of who God is and what he does. We remind each other in our prayers, just as Habakkuk does here. Our prayers encourage each other. When we pray out loud and we thank God for something he's done in our life or something he's done in the church, we encourage each other, but when we don't do that, we cut each other off from that encouragement, from that edification, from that educational aspect of who God is and how he's worked in somebody's life. We like that public ministry to one another. And it gets us to the point, I think, as we were talking this morning, as a matter of fact, as we were talking about prayer and accepting what God is doing in the world. Our public prayers help us to yield to what God is doing, not always pushing our agenda, not always pushing our demands on God, not always demanding that God give us stuff or heal so-and-so or make us feel better. But when we know God and know what he's doing in the world, then we can pray that and others can hear it and we can all together align ourselves to what God is about to do, just like Habakkuk does here. Revive your work. He's calling the whole congregation to pray that God's will would be done. This is a public prayer. So let's not cut ourselves off from the encouragement and the edification and even the education that public prayers make. Let us pray publicly. Let us do that. Let us know God well enough that we want to in some way overflow with thanksgiving and pray down God's spirit on us. And ask him to do the work he said he's going to do, which is to build his church. Let us ask him to do that, just as Habakkuk did in his day. Revive, make known, remember mercy. God responds here, as God always does with prayer. He always answers prayer. And he responds here in a startling way. He reveals himself to Habakkuk. And Habakkuk relates this revelation to the rest of the congregation. This is called the big word. I went to seminary, so I had to throw in some seminary words once in a while. It's a theophany. It's an appearance of God. God shows up. Do you know God does that? You know from God, when we pray, when we pray publicly, God shows up. He hears our prayers. We learned that from Habakkuk. He shows up. So from verse 3 down to verse 16, we have this great theophany, this great appearance of God. And we're just going to hit the high points of it as we go through this, kind of point out what's happening here. It opens up, God comes from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Think about that. Reflect on that. Teman, Mount Paran, are areas south of Judah. 
They're in the present-day area of Jordan. This is a desert area. This is the area that Israel kind of experienced God as he was bringing them into the promised land through the book, throughout the book of Numbers. What he sees here is God on the march. God on the move. That God is coming from the south. And he is marching. And he is coming. He calls him the Holy One. I love that. This is Isaiah's favorite description of God. I think Isaiah uses it something like 31 or 33 times. You can count it when you go home. But he calls God all the time the Holy One. The Holy One absolutely set apart. Absolutely different. Absolutely powerful. Not dependent on anyone. Not compelled by anyone. Holy. Not like us. He's going to do things that he thinks is right that just don't sit with us sometimes. He's the Holy One that's coming. Verses 4 and 5. I've underlined those words splendor, praise, and radiance. He's coming. He's on the march. He's coming from the south, and his glory is on display. It can't be missed. It surrounds him. Again, reminding the readers of what they know from Israel's history, of how God's glory led them in the Exodus, how God's glory led them through the desert. You know, it's, it's uh, such a uh, true to life, I think, as we read these, because we really can't understand anything like this unless we can relate it back to something that we are familiar with. Right? We can't really relate uh, the beauty of, say, a portrait like the Mona Lisa and the history behind it to my two and three year old grandchildren. They just can't relate to it. They've got nothing in their experience that allows them to understand what the heck I'm talking about. Well, it's the same thing here. He's got to relate what's happening back to what they're familiar with in order to describe what God's doing in this vision. And he takes them back to that Shekinah glory. He takes them back to that glory that led them through the desert. And it's a glory that's on display. And the whole Bible talks about this. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens are telling the glory of God. For the faithful that look into the sky and look at the Milky Way, they see the glory of God. The unfaithful just see stars. Romans 1.19 says that which was known about God is evident within them, that is unbelievers, it's evident within them, for God has made it evident. For since the creation of the world as invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. In other words, God's power, his, his glory, is always on display for those who would see it. And that's what he's saying here. He's coming. And he is clothed with glory. And it's unmistakable. And not only is he radiating glory, but he's acting. Look at verses 5 and 6. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. Not only is he on display, but he's active in history. And again, he's calling the events of the Exodus, where pestilence and plague brought the, brought the most powerful nation on earth to its knees, and not in worship, although we know that every knee will bow. He brought Egypt to their knees by plague and pestilence. Again, the unfaithful look at things and, oh, that's an act of God. The faithful see God's hand at work. They know he's working. They know he's active and alive. As he acted in Egypt, so he's going to act in the future. We know that there's a time coming. The book of Revelation tells us that there's going to be a time when there's an ashen horse who goes forth and the rider's name is Death. And who will bring death 
to the world. Later, a great star called Wormwood is going to poison many. And who's doing that? Revelation 16 tells us it's the Holy One. It's God. He's on the march. He's on the move. He's active. That's what Habakkuk sees here. Verse 6. He, meaning God, stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Again, Habakkuk's vision here is going way beyond what's going to happen to Israel and Babylon. He's looking way beyond what's happening on his block. He sees the nations tremble. He sees God standing as judge over the whole world. All the nations are under his powerful control. And we know that because we have the fullness of revelation, a revelation Habakkuk never had. We know that day is coming when God is going to judge the whole world. We know a day is coming when the whole earth will stand before him as if naked and defenseless. And he will bring an answer to prayer. What do we learn from this before we go on? What do we learn from God's presence among the nations? Number one, Habakkuk's people and us today, we have no reason to fear. They got no reason to fear what the Babylonians are going to do to them. Yes. Yes, it's going to be painful. Yes, it's going to be heartbreaking. Yes, it's going to bring tears to their eyes. Read the book of Lamentations. But God's plan goes forward. God's salvation doesn't falter. God's people will yet again stand on the earth. They're going to be judged. But as we'll see in the next section, his people will be saved. They're not going to escape from his justice or his righteousness. That like Habakkuk's people, we too can stand firm today knowing that God sees every injustice. He is witness to every wickedness. Every baby that's aborted, he is standing right there and witnesses what is happening. And he will call that to account. Every child who's led astray, he takes note of that person and it would be better for them if they had a millstone around their neck and thrown into the sea than for the judgment that God is going to bring to bear on them. Now we can stand firm knowing that there is a day coming when justice and righteousness will prevail. So we can stand firm in our faith even in the midst of a fallen world. We can be sure that there's a time coming when God's word, every word of it, will be proven true. And we'll be rewarded for every good work. But God is not only present among the nations here, but in verses 10 through 16, we learn he is also present among his people. Verse 8, again, did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers or your wrath against the sea? Again, we hear echoes of the Exodus here. Did he make the Nile turn to blood because he was angry with the Nile? Did he cause the Red Sea to pile up so his people can go through because he was mad at the Red Sea? No, that's not why he did those things at all. Verse 9, did he unsheath his bow? <laughs> His weapons of war, did he make it, did he pull it out of his sheath, his holster essentially? Because why? He was angry? No, he was saving his people. That's what he was doing. He was moving heaven and earth. He was manipulating the whole created order in order to save his people. In an incredible, unexpected, 
inscrutable, incomprehensible way that people still don't believe. That's what he was doing. Look at verse 13. You went forth for the salvation of your people. Why the river? Why the sea? Why did you pull your bow out of its sheath? For the salvation of your people and the salvation of your anointed. God did the unexpected to save his people. And when he did it in the time of the Exodus, what he does 70 years after Habakkuk's time, where he puts Darius the king on the throne in order to release Israel, was totally unexpected. And what Jesus did at the cross because of the Father was not expected. Wasn't expected by Rome. Wasn't expected by Israel. Wasn't expected by any of the disciples. They took off. They ran away. But God put his own son on the cross for our salvation. He put his own son who bled out his precious blood in our place for our sin. Who laid three days in a grave because of our iniquity. Because God sentenced us to the death sentence. But he raised him again to show that Jesus did not die for his own sin. Because the penalty for sin is death. And death could not keep him because he did not sin. He died for our sins. He bore our sins to the cross. He bore our sins to the grave. And there they still lie buried. If you put your faith in Christ. If you trust him. If you rely on him, if you have firm faith in him, in the midst of a fallen world, he will save you. Now, tomorrow, until the day you die, and then even after that day, you will be saved. You will be glorified in heaven and raised from the dead. And all you need to do is have faith. Righteous, Habakkuk has told us, live by faith. If you want to live, Jesus is your life. So, again, we look at his, what he's done for our salvation. We can apply this in a number of different ways. First of all, in light of his fierce judgment that's coming on the nations, and his fierce commitment to his people, we can have confidence that God is going to deliver us. He delivered his nation of Israel. There are proof. He will deliver them again. But he will also deliver us. He will deliver us from the unholiness that's coming down upon us, from being led astray. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's sanctification at work. He will deliver us from the grave. And we can be absolutely sure of that. That just as he is fierce against evil, he is fierce in our salvation. Also notice how often the sailors show up in this section here. We need to stop and reflect on this sometimes. We need to think about God's judgment and his mercy. We need to think about the preciousness of our salvation. And the God who saved us isn't about to lose us. He's not about to let us go, that we're secure in him. And again, as we learn more about God and learn more about his ways, this is just another opportunity for us to erupt in public prayer, in thanksgiving, in gratitude, in confession of our sin. This is just another opportunity for us to speak up and talk about the praises of him. 
Talk about our confidence in him and our trust in him, which is just what Habakkuk does in this next section. Habakkuk just bursts out in praise here. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no fruit, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet, I'll exalt in the Lord. No matter what happens, look what he's talking about here. He's heard this voice of God. He's seen this vision of God. He knows God has the ultimate victory. So he's going to be absolutely committed to God. The Babylonians come and go. The Assyrians come and go. In the light of history, the Persian Empire, here and gone. The Greek Empire, here and gone. The Roman Empire, here and gone. The United States, we have our time. But we'll be we'll here, but we'll be gone. That's the way the world works. Where are you going to put your commitment? Certainly not in the Babylonian Empire. Certainly not in the, Assyria, the Persian Empire. Certainly not in the Roman Empire. Certainly not in the Greeks. They're come and gone. Certainly not in the United States. Open your eyes. You can see what's happening. What doesn't change? Well, we know from Habakkuk what doesn't change. God doesn't change. Where are you going to put your faith? In one of these governments or empires that have come and gone or is going? Is going? Or are you going to put your faith in the God of all comfort? The God of all patience? The God who chastens us? The God who does not change, who welcomes our prayers, who answers his people, who saves. That, I would suggest, is where you ought to put your faith. No matter what happens. That's what Habakkuk is saying here. He, he lists here six, six economic disasters that would fall on an ancient people. Any one of them by themselves is survivable, but all six are devastating. And Habakkuk says that result of this devastation, no matter what you do, Lord, I am sticking with you. Not only sticking with him, but look at verse 18. Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He's not just bearing it. He is not resolving himself to just put up with it and grit his teeth and bear it. He's not there to just tolerate it even. He's there to exalt, to rejoice. Brothers and sisters, even as we see the culture collapsing around us, and there's no sociologist, there's no cultural critic that would deny that the culture is collapsing. Some would say it's being made over. Others would say it's just dying. But all would agree it's collapsing. All would agree. In the midst of this collapse, you and I ought to be conspicuous by our praise and our joy in our God. That's what Habakkuk is telling us here. So, as we close up the book of Habakkuk, we note here finally that Habakkuk's joy his rejoicing has zero to do with his circumstances. It has nothing at all to do with what's going, around, going on around him. Just like us. We can rejoice. We can be glad. We can be optimistic. Because we have a vision that is eternal. Because we pray. 
We have a vision that's heavenly because we pray. We have an understanding of God's will because we are in his word and we pray. Habakkuk teaches us all about God's character. He teaches about the importance of prayer when we're faced with threatening, perplexing challenges. He teaches us how to pray and have access to the strength and the power and the character of God that people who don't pray don't have access to. They may be Christians, but if they're not in prayer, they don't have access to God. If they're not in their word, in the word, they don't even know the God they're praying to if they pray. But we do. Public prayer is our ministry to each other. It's our testimony to the Lord. The lack of prayer, both public and private in our lives, shows a lack of faith. If we are not praying publicly and we're not praying privately, we have no faith. That's what that shows. It shows us a lack of knowledge about God's character. As we've seen in Habakkuk, once we know God's character, we kind of bust out in pray, prayer. We bust out in praise. We can't, we can't keep ourselves from trying to communicate to this God who has revealed himself to us. And if we have no revelation of God, we have no prayer in our life. It shows us that we have really a lack of desire for God's glory. We're not after his glory. We want our will to be done. We're not paying attention to what he wants in his word. All we care about is what we want, and what we want is usually what we want right now. So not only do we tell him what we want, but we tell him what we need it or want it. Shows that we have a greater commitment to our own desires than we do the desires of God. So Habakkuk tells us that we need to know God. He tells us that we need to have a fervent commitment to him and that we need to be in prayer to him in order to have firm faith in a fallen world. That's what he's teaching us here. So what do we do? Well, let me just, it's obvious at this point, pray. If you find yourself prayerless, publicly and privately, confess that as a sin. That's what it is. It's a sin. When Jesus says, this then is how you ought to pray, and we don't pray, it is a sin. It weakens us. It makes us fearful. So pray, confess that sin, confess that sin of the lack of private and public prayer. And then just from a practical basis, I know in my own life, to set aside a regular time of prayer. For me, I get up first thing in the morning. I'm a morning guy, a morning person. You try to get a hold of me in the morning, you usually can't. I leave the mornings, I block that off for other things. In the afternoon, I interact with people. But I need a regular prayer time, so do you. When we were traveling this past week, my prayer time was really disruptive, it was anemic, it was simple. Because I didn't have my regular prayer time. So I have that regular prayer time, let me suggest even a regular place. You know, I can I'm picture myself in my mind's eye, my chair in the living room, where I pray every morning. So confess the sin of prayerlessness. Find a regular time. Do it right now. Write it down. And then let me just suggest that if you're not used to praying, if you haven't prayed in a long time, go to Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, where I read earlier the Lord's Prayer. Start there. I'm not saying pray the Lord's Prayer. He prayed that. That's fine. It's actually a pattern of prayer. 
our Father who art in heaven. You begin by acknowledging that God is in heaven and he rules and he reigns. We're not. He is. Open your prayer time by acknowledging that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not your will. Not what you think is so great. But he wants. Maybe that problem in your life is something he put there to grow you, to teach you patience. I hate the word patience, but maybe he's teaching you patience. Any number of things, but use that prayer as a pattern of prayer in your life. So confess your sin, set aside a regular time, open up your Bible, use Matthew 6, 9 through 13 as a pattern, and brothers and sisters, join me in prayer, both public and private. Speaking of public prayer, let's close. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Habakkuk here. He's grown to be a friend. Lord, after weeks of uh, teaching and preaching, 